Okay, so now we're going to talk about parameter estimation in log linear models. This is the problem of taking a set of training examples as input and producing as output a setting for the V parameters that I showed you in the previous part of this lecture. So a first key idea in parameter estimation is going to be the following. I'm going to assume I have some set of training examples. So each training example consists of an XY pair. So I'll write XI, YI to be the ith example in my training set. I'm going to assume I have little n training examples. Each XY pair is such that the XI is a member of the set of inputs, the YI is a member of the set of possible labels. So as one example in the language modeling problem, each XI would be a sequence of words, such as the dog saw, we have three words in this case, and each YI would be uh, a single word, which was seen following the sequence of words. Okay, and you can see it's easy enough, given a large amount of text, to gather training examples of this form, which basically consists of contexts together with the word appearing uh, as the next word in that particular context. So we're again going to employ maximum likelihood estimation in this scenario, at least as a first pass at this problem. A little later we'll see how to smooth these estimates, how to regularize them, but for now let's consider maximum likelihood estimation. And that means that the maximum likelihood parameters, V sub ML, are going to be the parameter values out of the space of all possible m-dimensional vectors that maximize some function L of V. So L of V is going to be a function that takes a parameter vector as input and returns some value, which is basically going to be a measure of how well those parameters fit the data. More precisely, it's going to be the log likelihood of the data under the parameters. So what does that mean? L of V is defined as follows. So I have a sum over the n training examples. I have a sum from i equals 1 to n. And then I have the log probability of the ith training example. So that's log of p of yi given xi under parameters v. OK, so the training sample is fixed. But as we vary the parameters v, these probabilities will change. They'll become higher or lower. And so here we just have a sum over all of these log probabilities, one log probability for each item in the training set. And that's how we define L of V. Now intuitively, we would like these probabilities to be as high as possible, reflecting the fact that our parameters V fit the data well. And so if we maximize this function L of V, we'll have put high probability on the training examples that we actually see. More formally, there are many nice properties you can derive of maximum likelihood estimation which apply quite generally and certainly apply to this particular case. Okay, so just to remind you, P takes the following form. It's E V dot F dot 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 over some normalization term. It takes this kind of form. If we take log of this whole thing, we end up, as I showed you just previously in this lecture, E uh, V dot F minus log something, okay? And so this expression here, to be more explicit, has this form where I have some i equals 1 to n of v dot f x i y i. So this is actually the feature vector on the ith uh, training example. And here I have these kind of log normalization terms. I have a sum i equals 1 to n log. Here I have a second sum over possible labels y primed e of v dot f of x i conjoined with I prime, uh, Y primed. Okay, so that is the basic definition of the maximum likelihood estimation problem. We're going to try to choose the parameters V to make this function L of V as large as possible. And so the, the big remaining question is how do we actually optimize L of V? How do we find these maximum likelihood estimates?
Before we get to that, I want to talk about one critical property of LV, which is the following. LV is concave. And this means essentially it is a very nicely behaved function. So although in the general case, finding a closed form solution to this argmax is not going to be possible, because LV is concave, um, it's fairly easy to optimize it. So what does it mean to be concave? Imagine we just have a single parameter, V1. Okay, so we have the one-dimensional parameter uh, vector in this case. And I have a graph of V1 versus LV. A concave function looks like the following. It basically, if you take any two points, so uh, two points here, then this line goes underneath the function. Um, and in particular, this means that if we find a local optimum of this particular function LV, it's also going to be the global optimum. Intuitively, this means we use any kind of hill climbing technique, it is going to reach the global maximum of this function. So this is a concave function. And in some sense, it's relatively easy to optimize. There have been many results in optimization showing that we can efficiently find the maximum of this kind of function. Here's a function which is not concave. So this function has multiple local optima, which are not actually global. So this is the global optimum. These are local optima, which are not globally optimal. And this is hard. This is non-concave, very roughly speaking. This is generally a much harder optimization problem. So the beauty, or one beautiful thing about this function L of V, is that it's actually a concave function. Of course, we're going to generalize this to the multidimensional case, but similar definitions apply. And so this is a concave function, which means that if we use some kind of hill climbing technique, we will, in general, converge to the global optimum of this function that we're trying to optimize. So again, to recap, unfortunately, it's difficult to find closed form solutions for this maximization problem. However, the fact that this function is concave means we can use hill climbing methods, for example, as we'll see in a moment, gradient ascent as a way of optimizing this function. So we will, in fact, use gradient-based methods to optimize this function. What does that mean? So now let's imagine we have L of V where V actually has two parameters. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is sketch a sort of set of contour lines for a hypothetical version of L of V. So these are contour lines exactly as you'd see on, see on a map. Okay. So that the peak of this function is right here, and these are uh, lines of equal value of L of V. So a gradient-based method looks like the following. We start at some point, maybe we'd start at the origin, so we might start with all parameters equal to uh, zero. And we calculate the gradient, which just means we calculate a direction which is the steepest direction from this point. And we might move as far as possible in that direction. So we might, for example, in this case, move to here, which is the optimal uh, point if we're restricted to move in this direction. So basically, if you think of, of climbing a hill, you start at some point, you look at the steepest way up the hill, and you walk um, the distance in that direction, which takes you to the maximum on this particular line. And then you have a new point. Again, we calculate the gradient. We move in this direction. And at that point, we might be fairly close to the optimal um, point here. Okay. Um, so that's the basic idea behind gradient-based methods or gradient ascent. At each point, we calculate uh, the gradient, then move in that direction, move in the steepest direction, until we're, um, we've, we're sufficiently close to the optimum of this function. So the gradients actually take a fairly uh, convenient form. So remember, again, L of V is the following. So I have sum equals 1 to n of V dot f. 
sum i equals 1 to n of this log function. And let's see what happens when we differentiate this with respect to a particular parameter v sub k. Okay, so if I differentiate this term, I simply get sum i equals 1 to n of fk. Okay, so this is, this is, this is very easy to calculate, this first term. I simply sum over all the training examples, calculating the value of the kth feature, and that gives me the first component of this derivative, the derivative with respect to vk. This log term takes a little bit more work to differentiate, and I won't take you through these steps in all the gory details. Again, you can refer to the notes that are provided with this class for a detailed explanation. But what we end up with is actually a fairly simple expression. So I have a sum i equals 1 to n, and now I have a sum over all labels y primed. I have the feature value fk applied to xi, which we're summing over, in conjunction with y primed, which we're also summing over. And now, remarkably, all I have here is in fact the conditional probability of y primed under our current model. So these terms are often referred to as empirical counts because if these fk's are indicator functions 0 or 1, this is basically the number of times this particular question for the kth feature has been true on our training sample. And these are often referred to as expected counts because they're kind of the expected number of times the feature has fired under our current model. Most importantly, both of these terms are fairly easy to calculate. Calculating these empirical counts, we just sum over the training samples, calculating the FKs. For the expected counts, it's a little bit more work. We have to sum over the training samples, calculate the probability distribution over the labels under our current parameters on that particular training sample, and multiply that in with the feature vector definition fk of xi and y primed. But nevertheless, this is fairly straightforward to calculate. So given these definitions, I can calculate the derivative with respect to v1, v2, right the way up to vm. So in this particular example, I calculate the derivative with respect to v1 and v2, and that will give me the direction in which I move, the gradient in which I move.